Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage AERA Executive Director, Felice Levine. Well, good evening, everyone. We are just delighted to be here for the fourth centennial lecture and discussion forum of the American Educational Research Association. And this is just one fabulous room. We were so much looking forward to coming to Oklahoma and Oklahoma City and being at the Oklahoma History Center is just a, is really just a joy for all of us. Uh, today, as everyone here and everyone joining us virtually online, we are live web streaming, um, has anchored on the topic of this, our fourth lecture, the opportunities and challenges of early child care and education and our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Deborah Lowe Vandell. So for those of you tweeting, and I'm not a tweeter, <laughs> but for those of you who are, the hashtag is AERA Lecture. And so tweet away, and we love the social media buzz that comes with that tweeting. I want to take just a few minutes to say how especially privileged we are to be here today. We recognize that this is a state with great history, great tradition. We've learned a lot in coming to this state, and we are especially are pleased to be in a state that represents 38 tribal nations. So it's a special joy, I think, and privilege for ARA to be with you, and we are especially pleased to have you with us. Many of you may wonder, who, who is <laughs> ARA, or what are we? And the longer words, the American Educational Research Association, and the reference to our centennial, uh, 1916 to 2016, begins to set in motion who we are as an association. As a field, we are deeply committed to advancing knowledge across the full spectrum of education and learning from early childhood, from the earliest developmental periods through workforce development, aging, higher education, and into the workforce. And we're particularly committed to doing that in terms of our mission, connecting to the communities and the public interests we serve. And when we introduced this lecture series, it was really with a dedication to that end. We have many meetings, many convenings of researchers, but we really wanted to reach out and connect with our cities, our states, our communities to share our knowledge, but to share that in a way that reaches to what you are doing and what you too want to know. So we're hoping this event is the beginning of that form of conversation. We want to thank the Spencer Foundation, who has been generous in their contributions in supporting our series. Uh, Spencer has been dedicated to the support of research and effective communication and dissemination about it. So why Oklahoma City and why Oklahoma? Well, it links to the theme and the topic of this lecture. This state has really been an innovator well known across the country for its innovation in early education and early child care and is a role model. None of our states, none of our cities are without our challenges and our complexities. And we will be taking some of that up this evening and you will be part of that conversation. But we um, very much selected this site because we knew it was a place of deep history, deep knowledge, and deep concern for what we are uh, doing as scholars and how we want to connect with you who are on the ground every day doing this fine work. So I will start with a bit of a formal introduction to Deborah Lowe. Vandell. She is a professor of education and psychology and founding dean at the University of California, Irvine. But I have to say, she started in the trenches, as she will tell you. <laughs> started in the trenches as a kindergarten teacher and as a second grade teacher. And that learning impelled a program of research and a way of connecting to what it is she does today. She is well known. She was telling me earlier today <laughs> how she was uh, in a, uh, abroad and cited for her work in, um, in, 
in uh, not just in early child care, but in, in um, learning and educational experiences outside of the school context. Today we're going to be talking about early education and the work that she has been doing, uh, but not only the work she has been doing, also that how that connects to bodies of literature that she knows well. She is a fellow of the American Educational Research Association and of the American Psychological Association and of the Association of Psychological Sciences. But she's also a fabulous mentor. So what you will see today and what we'll be sharing with you in a brief lecture is wise counsel, wise advice, and connecting to this topic in a way that we hope will engage you in a conversation. So we have our living room setting here. <clears throat> and <laughs> after the lecture, you will be joined by uh, three members of your community and a member of the media to engage in a moderated discussion so that we hope you will join us and be part of that community of conversation. With that, let me welcome Deborah Vandell. <clears throat> Thank you, Felice, for your introduction, and thank you and your team at AERA for all of your work organizing this AERA Centennial Lecture. It is a great honor for me to be a part of this lecture and to have an opportunity to speak to you on the topic of early care and education. There was a time when I was in graduate school in the early 70s that early childhood was not really part of mainstream education research. It was an area that some of us in child development studied because we were interested in babies and young children. But it was a bit of a niche area that was not really generally viewed as an important part of the education system. A lot has changed since that time. And we've seen a gr dramatic growth in the interest in early care and education by families, educators, researchers, and policymakers. In a recent survey of voters conducted in 2016, 90% of the public endorsed public investments in early education to increase the quality and number of programs serving young children. But in the last two or three years, questions have been raised about the impacts of early childhood education on children's development. Are the findings all that we thought they were? Or are the effects of these programs not really worth the investment? This is the question that we're going to be addressing tonight. The interest in early care and education has grown out of a convergence of factors. The first is the work in neuroscience. This research has highlighted the important brain development that happens in the first five years in which there's an interplay between genes and children's early experiences that set the stage for children's language, cognitive, and social development. A second factor are the research findings that the skills that children have when they come to kindergarten are very predictive of the skills that they then have in elementary school, middle school, and even into adulthood. Societal changes in women's employment has also played a role. Currently, 65% of the mothers of young children are in the workforce, and their children are spending significant amounts of time in early care and education. And finally, the interest has been motivated by the evidence of large academic achievement gaps. <coughs> Low-income children are coming to kindergarten with literacy and math skills that lag behind their more affluent classmates by a year or more. This deficit is difficult to make up when children enter the K-12 education system. But perhaps the most compelling factor contributing to the growth in interest in early care and education has been the findings from the early intervention projects that were conducted in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. The Perry Preschool Project was a high-quality preschool program for economically disadvantaged three- and four-year-olds in Ypsilanti, Michigan. 
the children received half-day, high-quality center care, as well as weekly home visits. Children in the treatment and control groups have now been followed to age 40. In the Abecedarian Project, conducted in North Carolina, economically disadvantaged children received high-quality center care starting in infancy at about six weeks of age that continued through kindergarten. The children in this study have been followed to age 30 years. The Chicago Child Parent Program was offered by the Chicago Public Schools. It provided comprehensive services to low-income children that included two years of preschool followed by kindergarten. A key element of this program was parent involvement at the school each week. These children have been studied to age 26. And finally, the Infant Health and Development Program offered services at eight sites around the U.S. to low birth weight children in a program that was similar to the Abecedarian program. This program included both low-income and middle-income children and offered services from birth to age three. These children have been followed to 18 years of age. All of these programs shared an important feature. All offered high-quality programming led by highly skilled teachers. So what were the effects of these early projects? Short-term effects were found in all four programs. In the Infant Health and Development Program, children receiving the treatment had higher IQ scores and higher receptive vocabulary scores at age three when the program ended. In the other three projects, children who attended the high-quality programs had higher IQ, reading, and math scores when the programs ended. Impacts in the medium term, middle term, were a more mixed bag. On the one hand, there were higher achievement test scores in the Abecedarian, in the Perry, and in the Chicago Parent Child, and also in the IHDP project for the children who were the heavier birth weight children. There was also less special ed placements, and there was less grade retention in the treatment studies in two of those projects. On the other hand, IQ effects had faded in the later elementary grades. It is when we look at the long-term findings from these studies that we see the strongest impacts. Impacts were found in education, with children being less likely to drop out of high school, more likely to be high school graduates, and in the case of the Abecedarian, more likely to graduate from college. We see differences in earnings, with, with the participants in the high-quality programs being less likely to be um, receiving welfare and having higher <laughs> earnings. We see less crime and less involvement in the criminal justice system for those who had been in the early high-quality programs, and we see better health outcomes at age 30 and at age 40. These interventions have had a major impact on education policy and early childhood, but they occurred in a different time when early childhood programs were less available, especially those serving low-income children. And two of these projects were small demonstration studies. Research has now turned to contemporary early childhood programs where the questions are, can high quality early care and education be offered at scale? Do we see program effects when children begin kindergarten? Do the effects of these programs persist or do they fade away over time in the middle term, in the long term? In answering these questions, we will look at three different types of early care and education. The most common type of care serving some 5.3 million children is parent-funded child care. These include nonprofit and for-profit child care centers and also family day care. What's notable about this care is that it is funded by parents. The second is federally funded Head Start. This is the program that began under President Johnson as part of the War on Poverty. It currently serves some one million low-income three- and four-year-old children. The focus on this program is on education outcomes, but also on health outcomes. The third big project is state pre-K. These programs serve some 1.4 million 
four-year-old children in the year before kindergarten. And these are funded by school districts and also by the states. This is the fastest growing segment within the early childhood education field. 45 states now offer state pre-K programs. Most of these are targeted programs serving economically disadvantaged children. Seven states have universal programs, meaning that they are open to all children, regardless of family income. The program here in Oklahoma is a universal program. Even with Head Start and targeted pre-K, there are substantial inequities in access to early childhood programs. 90% of the four-year-olds whose families are in the top income bracket the top 20 percentile, attend an early care and education program as four-year-olds, compared to 64% of the children in the two lowest income brackets. Almost all of the early child care attended by low-income children is publicly funded, Head Start or State Pre-K. Most of the programs attended by higher income children are funded by fees paid by their parents. The cost of childcare and education are putting a strain on most families. As an example, for families in the Midwest, counting Oklahoma, who have two children in center-based care, the cost can exceed the cost of housing, the single largest expense faced by most families. If the family has one child in center-type care, the cost often exceeds the cost of higher education in that state. Um, the cost for the middle part of the U.S., we have higher costs on the East Coast and the West Coast. The, the southern part of the U.S., the costs are a little less. For the five million families who are paying for early care and education, the high cost of care is a major challenge. As the grandparent of, of my new grandson, I know very well the cost of childcare for families. It's a big one. What do we know about the effects of these programs on children's skills and competencies? In answering this question, we must consider program quality. The single factor most consistently related to program impacts across the three sectors of early care is program quality. What do I mean by quality? Structural quality refers to the kinds of things that the state or local community can regulate. Things like teacher education, teacher training or professional development, group size, which is the number of children in a class, ratio, the number of children per teacher in a class. These structural features have been found to set the stage for the second type of quality that we look at, and that is process quality. Process quality refers to the children's experiences in the program, the types of interactions that they have with their teachers. What sorts of emotional support are they receiving? What kinds of instructional support? What are the activities in the program? How well do those activities match children's interests and skills? That's process quality. What we find in literally hundreds of studies is that process quality is related to child developmental outcomes. In one study that I've been involved with now for more than 20 years, we studied the effects of process quality. In this study, funded by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, the part of the National Institutes of Health that focuses on children's health and development, my colleagues and I have followed the development of 1,350 children from middle class as well as low-income children from birth to the end of high school. As part of that study, we observed the children in their child care settings at six months, 15 months, two years, three years, four and a half years. We then followed the and while we were there, we assessed them in terms of structural quality and process quality. We then followed the children into elementary school where we observe them in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Then we followed the children to middle school and then to high school at age 15 and then again at the end of high school. Among other findings, we found that the quality of early childcare 
was related to standardized reading and math achievement scores prior to kindergarten. And then again in the elementary grades, grades one, three, five. And then again at age 15. Center type care was related to achievement scores prior to kindergarten and then at age 15, but not in elementary school. At the end of high school, we found that both quality and type of early care were related to outcomes such as class rank, college admissions, and academic grades. We are now planning the age 26 follow-up of these study children. Others have also studied the effects of quality of care. Recently, Peg Birchenall published an extensive secondary data analysis of eight large data sets that included child care centers, Head Start, and pre-K programs. She found quality of care was important across all three of these sectors. In her work, she also identified a threshold of quality to get the benefits, for children to get the benefits of these programs, the programs needed to be high quality. So now let's turn to the research that examined the effects of Head Start on economically disadvantaged children. Over the years, we've had a number of studies of Head Start, including work by Deming, also the work of the Head Start Impact Study, and also the work of Deborah Phillips and William Gormley in Tulsa. <coughs> One of the most rig rigorous of these studies is the one by David Deming, Deming, who used the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth to test for short-term and long-term effects of Head Start. In this work, Deming studied families in which one child received Head Start and the sibling did not. When he looked at test scores, he found positive short-term effects when children were age five or six about the time they started to school. At the middle term, the findings were more mixed. In terms of grade retention and special education placement, he found that the Head Start children were less likely to be retained and less likely to receive a learning disability designation compared to their siblings. Fin findings related to test scores were more mixed. They were present at some ages and not at others. Deming also found long-term effects. Head Start participants were more likely to have graduated from high school and to have better physical health at age 20 than their siblings who did not attend Head Start. Another major evaluation is the Head Start Impact Study. This national study was commissioned by Congress in the late 1990s. From a list of interested families, 5,000 three- and four-year-old children were randomly assigned to either Head Start or a control group. This study found short-term impacts at the end of Head Start for three-year-olds in literacy and math and four-year-olds in literacy but not math. There were larger impacts for children who were English learners than for those who were native speakers. However, these test score differences faded away in early elementary school. We are going to have to wait and see if these findings, if these effects come back as the children um, reach older ages. Program effect has also been identified as a potential contributing factor to these modest findings from the Head Start Impact Study because observations of the Head Start classrooms indicated that quality varied widely in them. Only 40% of the programs in the Head Start Impact Study were observed to be high quality. The remainder were medium or low quality. Since the Impact Study, Head Start has been focusing on quality improvement. The proportions of teachers with BA degrees has increased, Child-teacher ratios have been reduced. A large-scale observational study of Head Start quality has found significant gains in instructional quality, emotional support, and teacher-child interactions between 2006 and 2014. Recent research by Deborah Phillips and William Gormley conducted in Tulsa suggests that these quality improvements may yield fruit. Phillips and Gormley recently published a longitudinal follow-up of the Tulsa Community Action Program Head Start. All indications are that that Head Start program was high quality. The structural quality was high, 
teachers had a BA degree or higher, the program ratios of 10 to 1, the group sizes of 20. The Head Start teachers were paid on the same scale as pre-K teachers in Tulsa. And observations confirmed that the process quality was high quality programming. The impacts of the CAP Head Start on child outcomes are consistent with those that are found in other high quality programs. There were short-term impacts on literacy, spelling, and math at the beginning of kindergarten. In the follow-up, at grade eight, the Head Start attendees had higher math achievement, less grade retention, and were less likely to be chronically absent. We're gonna have to wait and see how these Head Start graduates do as young adults. Let's now turn to the third sector of early care, and that's public pre-K. Here we're gonna be focusing on the results from four public pre-K evaluations. The pre-K programs in Tulsa and Boston are universal programs located in public schools. The classes are taught by degreed teachers. Both are observed to be of high quality. The public pre-K in Boston includes extensive mentoring and coaching for its staff. It uses a math curriculum building blocks that's been proven to be effective in preschool classrooms. The Abbott program in New Jersey and the Tennessee program are targeted programs. The Abbott program has generally been observed to be high quality. Observations of the Tennessee program using the ECHRs, the Early Childhood Rating System, indicate that 85% of those programs were less than good, suggesting that the care did not meet the high quality threshold. What are the short-term findings of these programs? When children's performance was assessed at the beginning of kindergarten, we see sh positive short-term effects in all four programs. In Tulsa and in Boston that serve both low-income and middle-income children, there were larger effects for the low-income children, but all of the children in the programs had beneficial effects. The effects of the Tennessee program were smaller, still significant, but were less than the other pre-K evaluations. So what happened in the middle term? In Tulsa, we see higher math achievement for pre-K boys in grade three. At the follow-up, we see higher math achievement for low-income children, boys and girls, relative to their peers who were not in the program. In the New Jersey Abbott program, we see decreased grade retention and decreased special education placements in grades four and five. In Tennessee, the middle term results were disappointing. The differences in test scores favoring the pre-K group disappeared at the end of kindergarten, and by third grade, the pre-K group was lower on achievement scores than the control group although parent teachers reported more positive peer relations and fewer problem behaviors for the pre-K group of children. In Boston, the middle term results have not yet been reported. They are anticipated later this spring. The decline in the program effects in the Tennessee pre-K, coupled with the lack of program effects in the Head Start Impact Study in the middle term, has resulted in a lot of attention, leading to speculation that early care effects do not persist. There's also been much discussion about what is needed to sustain effects. Based on the research, three strategies warrant particular attention. The need to support and strengthen the early care workforce, to coordinate the sequencing of activities and programming during the first five years, and to align K-3 instruction to reflect the skills that children developed in early childhood. Let's look at each of these in turn. As noted by Deborah Phillips and Marcy White book, early childhood teachers constitute the linchpin of quality. This same point has been made in a recent consensus report from the National Academies of Science that stated, it is through the quality work of early childhood teachers that the nation can make it right for the beginning of all of its children. In supporting staff 
we need to focus on education and professional development, as well as wages, as strategies to improve program quality and to reduce turnover. Coaching, or ongoing professional development, in which experts model instruction, observe practice, and provide constructive feedback has been found to be an effective tool in improving program quality. In one recent synthesis report, 13 of 14 studies show coaching to improve preschool teachers' curriculum implementation. A hallmark of all of the successful programs that we describe today is that their teachers were reasonably compensated. As shown in this slide, these salaries are not typical. Early childhood teachers are woefully underpaid for the work that they do. Childcare workers have not had a real increase in earnings since 1997, and they are currently earning less than $10 an hour across the U.S. They fall in the bottom 3% of all workers. Preschool teachers who instruct preschool children in the activities designed to promote their social, physical, and intellectual growth needed for primary school earn less than $15 an hour and are in the 19th percentile of all workers. Given the high demands of the job and the low compensation, the turnover rates in early childhood are not surprising. The lead teacher turnover in Head Start is 25% each year. Turnover in other programs vary from 7 to 27% in different types of programs in comparison to the turnover rates of 7 to 8% for K3 teachers. Increasing the education level, ongoing professional development, and wages have got to be a priority if we are going to have high quality early childhood education. Sustaining the effects of early childhood programs also is going to be more likely if the programs are thoughtfully sequenced to build on children's developing skills. Having children repeat the same learning activities for a second year or a third year is not going to foster their learning and development. The activities and programming for two-year-olds needs to be differentiated from that that is offered to three-year-olds, which needs to be differentiated from the pre-K programs for four-year-olds. Skills need to build from one year to the next. As an example, studies find that two years of Head Start are greater than one year of Head Start, but the effect of the second year is smaller than the first. My colleague Jay Jenkins at the University of California, Irvine, has found larger gains when children had one year of Head Start followed by one year of pre-K versus two years of Head Start. The general point is that programming during the first five years needs to match children's growing skills. Finally, we need to align K-3 instruction to reflect the skills that children have developed in their early childhood programs. This point builds on my previous point. We need stronger connections between early care and education and the primary grades of elementary school. Kindergarten and first grade classrooms need to build on the academic skills that children bring with them to kindergarten. And the longitudinal follow-up of the building blocks, math curriculum, for example, children were more likely to sustain their math gains if their kindergarten and first grade teachers built on and strengthened and deepened the math ideas that had been developed in the preschool gains that were not maintained when the elementary school teachers did not provide this kind of support. Daphne Bassick's analyses of the early childhood longitudinal study are relevant to this point. She found a shift in pre-academic skills that children bring to kindergarten between 1998 and 2010. These shifts were particularly pronounced in the areas such as letter knowledge and reading simple books independently. If kindergarten classrooms focus on skills that children have already mastered, we lose learning opportunities. Findings from Mimi Engel and her colleagues demonstrate the same point with mathematics. 
they found that although the majority of children, the vast majority of children entering kindergarten had already mastered uh, basic counting and knowledge of basic geometric states, uh, shapes, that kindergarten teachers reported spending most of their mathematics instruction time on these activities typically 13 days a month. On average, the exposure to basic mathematic content was related negatively to children's learning during the year. For children to be gaining, the skills that they're taught need to reflect what they're needing to learn. Only those children who had the most basic skills were the ones that were benefiting from the kindergarten teacher's focus on those most basic skills. The others benefited from higher level, more advanced content. We began this evening by posing the question, is early care and education worth the investment? From the classic projects that were initiated in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we saw short-term benefits on children's academic outcomes and long-term benefits on educational attainment, earnings, health, as well as reductions in crime. In the middle term, there were some mixed findings with the effects present at some ages and not others for some outcomes and not others. To date, we see similar pattern of findings in the latest generation of studies. We are seeing consistent reports of short-term impacts and some mixed reports of middle-term outcomes of high-quality programs that mirror the early reports. But we're going to have to wait a bit to see if the, there are long-term effects of these contemporary studies because the children have not yet reached those older ages. In the meantime, research tells us the conditions that need to be in place to maximize the likelihood of positive program impacts. Programs must be high-quality. And the linchpin of quality are highly skilled teachers who can oversee the activities and curricula that build on and reflect children's skills. We also need to better align early childhood programs and the primary grades so that children can continue to build their skills and not take a step backward. Are these investments in early care and education worth it? Without a doubt. Thank you. So, I didn't undersell. <laughs> that was fabulous. Let's do another round of applause. I think everyone in this room is really kind of palpable in this room, some of whom we've met uh, uh, last evening and earlier today. Those of you who are joining us virtually, we all have to be in this for the long haul. If there are bumps along the way, we have to figure out how we can intervene with our best research, our best data, and our best knowledge, and we've just heard that from just about the best. So Deborah, come to our living room. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to, uh, I want to mention that there are stand-up mics, so we really want everyone to come to the event with us. But I will just briefly introduce um, Ben Felder, who I think in this group needs no introduction. And I've been viewing some of his videos, and now I'm a big fan myself. He covers education and some of the political dimensions of education and education uh, in, in this state and in this region and does a spectacular job. And we really want to have a moderator that understands the context and the issues and the challenges that you all face in this environment so that we can link to our knowledge and have the kind of conversation that as we leave our living room, uh, will have some sustaining and future impact. So Ben and the commentators, please join us in our gracious living room. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. 
Um, I first want to say uh, thanks to the AERA for this invite to participate tonight. I've really been looking forward to this lecture and this uh, panelist discussion for several reasons. One, as a journalist who covers uh, education, um, obviously I, I'm fascinated by this topic and the things that we'll, we'll talk about and that will come out of this. Um, also getting a chance to see a little bit of the audience list. I know that we have a great audience and a very diverse crowd in terms of uh, people that work in this field, that study this field, and have uh, invested interest in this. So I'm looking forward to the to questions that you might deliver tonight too. I uh, also have to say that as a parent of a pre-K student, um, this obviously is a topic that really hits home uh, at our house as well. But I'm also excited because we have a great panel here tonight. And um, I'm excited for the conversation that's going to take place. And in a moment, uh, I want to give our panelists a chance to uh, kind of debrief the lecture and provide some of their thoughts before we head into a question time. But first, let me uh, provide some introductions here. Uh, first with uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Sandifer, who is the Provost and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at Oklahoma State University. And uh, Gary, I have to say that actually in doing some research of you, I came across uh, a book that you wrote in the 1990s or co-wrote, uh, Growing Up uh, with a Single Parent, mm -hmm. downloaded to my Kindle that night and kind of got caught up in it. So <laughs> put that plug in that for your book. Uh, Deborah Anderson is the Executive Director of Smart Start Oklahoma, a statewide early childhood initiative that serves as Oklahoma's early childhood advisory council and works to improve public policies that support young children and their families here in Oklahoma. And then finally, Danny Wells is the Division of Education Executive Officer for the Chickasaw Nation and supervises the six education departments, which include child care, early childhood, and education services. So uh, thank you so much for, for your time. And uh, like I said, we'll start here uh, to my, immediately to my left. Uh, Gary, just kind of uh, your thoughts and, and hearing this lecture um, and, and on this topic. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I know this is a living room conversation. I just want you to know I always bring prepared remarks to my uh, living room conversations. <laughs> that's, that's what I've done tonight. I, I'd like to thank the AERA and its executive director, Felice Levine, for inviting me to participate in the event this evening. I'd also like to express my appreciation to my former colleague at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Deborah Vandell, for her stimulating presentation on early child care and its impact on children and families. I am by no means an expert on early child care or its effects. I do think, however, that is one of the most important areas about which all citizens need to be concerned. An informed citizen needs to have a basic understanding about the problems and the opportunities in early child care. My comments as a citizen come from three perspectives. My work as a family demographer, to which you alluded, in my previous pre-university administrator life. I did work on families and the impact of families on child well-being. Uh, my work as a university administrator, uh, I'm very interested in academic preparation of undergraduate students entering the university. And my commitment to the goals of Oklahoma Works in building Oklahoma's workforce. Dr. Vandell shared with us this evening some of the most advanced and cutting edge research on the cost of childcare to families and the impact of early childcare on children. The cost of childcare to families can be overwhelming, as you saw from her slide. These costs can have an impact on children since they may limit the ability of families to afford high quality childcare. Yet these costs also have an effect on the families. The inability to afford childcare can impede the ability of mothers with young children to continue their educations. If one cannot afford regular child care and has no other family members on which to rely for consistent help, one will have difficulty attending a post-secondary educational institution. According to a 2014 study from the Institute for Women's Policy Research, as reported in The Atlantic, 4.8 million, or about one quarter of college students are parents of dependent children. Now, many of these are non-traditional students, but they're parents with children that are trying to continue their post-secondary education. And as you all know, affordable child care on or near campuses is very difficult for uh, parents to find. Working parents face a similar set of issues. According to a report from NPR in 2016, a poll from NPR, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health found that close to one-third of working parents who pay a fee for childcare say that this causes financial problems for them. 
These plot costs place constraints on the ability of parents to work, and trying to find childcare for an infant or dealing with sick children makes the problem even more pronounced. In some, the costs of childcare have an impact on children, but they also have an impact on the ability of parents to complete their education and to be productive members of the workforce. Although I do not have the time nor the expertise to explore all of the policy options that would help, as the NPR report <coughs> notes, one would be to raise the limits on pre-tax contributions to the dependent care flexible spending accounts, which I think are still set at uh, an, really an outrageous limit of $5,000. Um, given my focus on the post-secondary education and workforce productivity of young people, my interest in the findings on the effects of child care discussed by Dr. Vandell this evening are primarily in looking at the long-term findings. As she pointed out, the findings from the early studies were very promising. And I know Deborah remembers, as I did, being a young researcher, how exciting it was to see those findings coming out back when they began to come out. Um, the quality of early child care had an effect on high school graduation, earnings, criminal activity, and health. More recent studies also show, show some promising effects, though, as Deborah noted, um, it's still too early to tell from some of the st stories, uh, studies because it, the children are not yet old enough. The quality and type of care, though, are associated with high school graduation, class rank, college admission, grades, and physical health. In some, the type and quality of care that individuals receive early in life has an impact on their likelihood of attending a post-secondary institution. This will, in turn, affect their success in the worker, workforce. As a former researcher who used nationally supported studies and data sets, such as those discussed tonight, I cannot complete my remarks without commenting on how important these studies and data are. I am a firm believer, as I know probably all of you are, in evidence-based policies and interventions. We cannot have the evidence if we do not do the studies and collect the data. So it is important for all of us to advocate for continued data collection research on early child care and its impact on families and children. To conclude, for those of us who are interested in higher education and a productive workforce, there are good reasons to be deeply interested in the costs and impact of early child care. The costs of early child care create financial difficulties for young families with children, making it more challenging for them to complete post-secondary education and be productive members of the labor force. The early child care experiences of individuals affects them not only in the short term, but also in later life as they enter post-secondary education and the workforce. We all have good reason to want to lower the costs and increase the quality of early child care. Again, I would like to thank the AARA for inviting me to be here this evening, and, and again, thank Professor Dr. Vandell for her really interesting presentation. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And uh, Deborah? Yes, hello, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I have mic issues, I'll try to work it out. Hope you can hear me. Um, I also would like to thank the American Educational Research Association for choosing Oklahoma as one of your stops um, in your lecture series and also for recognizing the great early childhood work in Oklahoma. We're honored that you selected our state to have this important conversation, a national conversation, about early care and education research. Um, thank you, Dr. Vandell, for your concise and powerful presentation. I think it was spot on to the needs that we have in Oklahoma. Um, your points remind us that Oklahoma has a long history of leveraging research to create early care and education, to create that landscape in our state. Um, I am honored to be um, included as, as someone from early childhood to talk on this panel, and I want to recognize that the experts are in the audience, and so I look forward to being able to, to hear from, from you all in the very, very near future. I want to give just a, a snapshot of a couple of things that, that I thought about when Dr. Vandell was presenting and how that relates to our work currently in early childhood in Oklahoma. Um, our Sooner spirit was strong in the late 1990s when, in addition to our long-standing Head Start programs, we made great strides in universal pre-kindergarten, home-based parent support, and the nation's first quality rating scale in child care. Those were three really big milestone markers that we did um, in the late 90s. 
Um, we've also been very successful recently in getting five grantees, hopefully more in the near future, for Early Head Start Child Care Partnership grants, which is really cutting edge, good practice in how we support our infants and, and toddlers in our state. Despite the budget challenges that we have in our state and frequent pressure that we get to identify ways to save costs, we continue to lead the pack in the country for adhering to high standards and qualities in each of these areas. We also want to ensure that our investments yield the intended outcomes as highlighted in your presentation, ever the more that we maintain the quality that, that we have established. Um, we also recognize that in order to ensure that children arrive to school prepared, we must focus on coordination of additional services such as prenatal care, health and mental health, nutrition, housing, transportation, education, job training, just to name a few. So we very much recognize that the, the three buckets of early care and education are also supported, families are supported by all of those other services as well. Um, and finally, we do recognize in our state how <coughs> important adequate preparation and ongoing training for the early childhood professional workforce is to, de in, to ensure that we're delivering the best, most effective services. Um, in Oklahoma, we believe on spending our dollars on what works, and we don't have a lot of extra dollars to spare right now. We've had some pretty dire news again for a third kind of serious year in a row, um, and we have a lot of challenges to achieving our attended results. Um, our kids and families face a lot of uh, barriers in terms of, of uh, being successful. Um, on the Kids Count Report in 2016, we ranked 37th overall, and that was like better than we had been for several years when we were in the 40th, 40s. Um, Child Trends Report on Adverse Childhood Experiences um, had, a, had a quote that said, Oklahoma has a consistently high prevalence of all ACEs. Um, unquote, we were among the top three worst states in the nation for adversities that are affecting our children from birth to age 17. So that's a lot to overcome that we hope to help um, mitigate some of those factors through high quality early care and education, but we have a lot of factors that are working against us. Um, while the challenges seem daunting, Dr. Van Dell's presentation reminds us that we are on the right track in our state. Um, our, but our investments must be sustained, and we must take to scale our efforts to continue investments in our young children and their families. Um, a couple of things that our organization, um, the Oklahoma Partnership for School Readiness Board, has had a couple of priorities for um, several years, and we're making great gains on those, and I want to just briefly highlight those, and we can talk later if we need to. Um, one is the State Department of Education is planning the implementation of a comprehensive early learning inventory to um, objectively inform kindergarten teachers on the skills that children have already mastered, identify areas that need improvement, and ensure that early specialized intervention for children who are significantly behind upon uh, kindergarten entry occurs. Children come to school from a variety of early learning experiences. And I would suspect that kindergarten teachers have probably one of the most diverse group of children in their classroom in the entire building. Um, positive outcomes are achieved in the early years, um, but can be jeopardized in the elementary years, as we saw with concerns of some of the, the um, mixed results with midterm outcomes. Um, and we must pay attention to the ongoing developmental process that's occurring within a five-year-old child. Currently, we put a lot of attention and pressure on early literacy development, which is very important, but five-year-olds need to continue to make gains in developing language, motor, cognitive, and behavior skills. These skills are as important to future academic success as identification of numbers and letters, maybe more so at this age. We also um, are supporting an integrated early childhood data system so that we can look at our administrative data in the long term, understand uh, participation in programs early. How does that participation play into later development? Are we making sure that we're targeting our resources um, to the children and families that can benefit most from the proven interventions that we know that are available? 
Um, so with that, I would like to say thank you for this opportunity to participate in this lecture. We look forward to continuing <coughs> our efforts in Oklahoma, um, informed by research to ensure that, as our vision is, all children enter school safe, healthy, eager to learn, and prepared when they enter school. Thank you. <coughs> My turn. Danny, yeah. <laughs> First of all, uh, Chokma, which is good evening or hello in Chickasaw. I uh, appreciate that's about my, I have a little bit more, but I'm not, I don't know a lot more, but I'm very humbled to have the opportunity to uh, be with this panel, to have the opportunity to talk about early childhood uh, education because it is of the utmost importance. I'm a retired school teacher, uh, taught three different areas, so I couldn't make my mind up what I wanted to teach. I've also been a Head Start director, uh, so I've kind of been around education, and that's pretty well all I've ever done, and I have a passion for education because I know the difference it makes. I know the difference it's made in my life, and I've seen the difference it's made in my students' lives. You know, Dr. Vandell has made a number of very valid comments about the significance of quality education and quality educators. And, uh, and I will tell you, this is a difficult thing for a teacher to do, to sit in a chair and talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm used to being right there, so I'll try to do the best that I can, but if you'll bear with me, but, uh, and probably all of us picked out different things that we thought were significant. As you listened to her presentation, she had a mountain of information, and all of us, because we have different personalities, different perceptions, we probably heard different things. One of the key things that I heard that really stood out to me was sustainability. When you look at uh, all the research that's done, there's a question always about the su sustainability of children that, uh, in early childhood. And, uh, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that. But I think that number one thing that she mentioned was that we have to support and strengthen early childhood education workforce. And I absolutely agree with that. I think that we need to provide some coaching and some mentors, which we all know is significant. That's important, particularly for new teachers. The other thing that she mentioned <coughs> is that we might need to have better uh, salaries, that we need to make sure that we improve our funding. And I know our state superintendent has, has been working hard on that because we, there, it's embarrassing the, what we pay our teaching staffs. And you saw those statistics over there when she made the comparison. Uh, and then number, th then number second one she had is attention focused on sequencing activities and programs. You know, we need, it's like building blocks. You know, we lay the first one down and we build on that. And that's where our life is and that's where our learning is. And so when we start building on those, we, we build, put this block down and we've got it mastered. We've got it in place. And then we come along, we put the second one on there and we've mastered that skill, that ability. And so as, as people that are involved in, in certainly that are uh, concerned about early education, we understand sequences is certainly very important. We also realize that it's building blocks of success in life. And so when we look at those things, I, I, prefer, I completely agree that we build on things that, that they already know. There's no use in repeating that because they know that. They've mastered that. Third thing she had listed there was we have to work to align the instruction for kindergarten through third grade and from my perspective and beyond. Uh, that we need to make sure that, those, that what the skills that they have, that they're reflected as they move in. Those things that they learned in early childhood, they just carry those things forward. And someone adds that next block rather than starting all over again. And that's what we have a tendency sometimes to do. But I think, you know, many of you may know the mission of the Chickasaw Nation is to, en to enhance the overall quality of life of Chickasaw people. And so that's what our, that's what our attempt is continually. Governor Antubby expects us always to strive for the best, always provide the best opportunities that we can for our citizens. And I think, you know, I'll share with you that we share that, we take that very, that responsibility very seriously. And I think the overall quality of life for Chickasaw citizens also improves the lives of all those around about them. Governor talks often about us being good partners. And so when we improve the life and enhance the life of our Chickasaw people, we do likewise with all those that come in contact with those people, all those people within that same community. And so that's what we need to be doing. We need to be working together. I think, you know, within our jurisdiction, which is about, thir about 13, calorie, uh, 13 counties, we have about 60,000 students, really a little bit more than that. And about 15,000 of those are Native American. Not, they're not all Chickasaw, but they're Native American. So if you, that's about 25%. And so we have a pretty high significance in Oklahoma of, of Native Americans. And so I'm going to speak a little bit more to that because that's part of the reason I think I'm on this panel. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, basically when you start looking at the service of programs, that we don't limit those to our Chickasaw systems because within communities, there's a, a very wide range of services and we rely on partners and we partner together. 
I, I would hope that all of the schools within our jurisdiction would tell you that they have a great partnership with the Chickasaw Nation because that's what we try to have. That's what we want to have because we know that that makes everyone better when we work, partner together. And I think that we realize that education provides a stepping stone for people to improve their lives and become more productive. Yeah, and I think one of the things that she mentioned, uh, mounting studies demonstrate that by age six, a child's capacity to learn is largely formed. And five or six, it, that it depends on which one you're looking at. I always tell one, everyone that uh, Head Start's really aptly named because it gives students an advantage, a head start. Uh, because let's face it, from one to five, they're like sponges. They want to know something because they don't know anything. And they want to know everything. And so be, being sponges as they are, they're always wanting to add more. And it's our, it's our responsibility to make sure that's available to them. It's our responsibility to make sure that the information they want, that they need so desperately, it's available to them. And we need to do that in whatever method it, that's necessary to do that. You know, I think that one of the things that I, in, when I start reading, one of the things I read not long ago was a high level of simulation about books and talking, having conversations. And I think one of the things that was illustrated on hers was those that are, have higher incomes have more communication with their children. Uh, they read to their children more. That's, that's a proven research fact. And I think that one of the things that a child that has parents that do that or are exposed to early childhood, what they'll have is a 20,000 word vocabulary compared to those that are not exposed to early childhood or have about 5,000 word vocabulary. That's significant. That's huge to me. And I think research also shows us that quality programs require less special and remedial education. And she pointed that in her, out in her as well. And one of the things that, I, that I've shared with others is that one of the things that we find is, is that research shows that as teenagers, they have lower pregnancy rates. They have lower delinquency rates. They have higher test scores. And I think they have higher high school graduation rates, which is much what you saw there. And so I completely agree with that. And, and lastly, uh, I think the early childhood is a critical time for them to develop physical, and she mentioned this as well, emotional, social, cognitive skills. Those things are all developed, and they begin when they're babies. And adults who receive early education, and we, do some, we do see some of those results, because after all, Head Start, for instance, was established in 1965, President Johnson, as she, as she mentioned. And it was all about establishing the opportunity for low-income families to have their children exposed to social things to develop them socially. We all know, if you know anything about Head Start, it's changed, it's morphed. You know, it's all about academics. It's also about social, but it's, it has changed so much that now just as important as social are the academics. And, and I will tell you that for us and in in what we do, you know, and what we understand is that national research, research is clear that the earlier children are exposed to rich learning environment, the better chance they have of succeeding in school. And I'll share with you a couple of things that we do that I think are significant that, and I think that's, that's one of the things I was asked to do is to share some best practices. And I can tell you that, and he talked about my, the six areas and really I think he mentioned three of those really. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit. If you don't, I'll give a couple of minutes, I won't take long, but I want you to know that our early child development program consists of a department of child care and Head Start. So we kind of put those together as early childhood. So we have child care, and then we have Head Start, and really this year we implemented a, a pilot program of preschool. So we, we feel like that early education is important enough that we have a very strong child care program. We have one I'd compare to any, any others in the nation. We have a Head Start program that's solid, that again, same thing we hear from Office Head Start all the time, how great our program is, and that's what we want to hear, that's what we expect to hear, because we try to make sure that it's that way. And then the preschool this year is uh, we began that because we had 80 students in our Head Start program at Ada, which is our headquarters. We had 40 or 50 students, all of whom were Chickasaw, on our waiting list. And that's hard to do to explain to parents how you have a Chickasaw program, but you can't get Chickasaw students in. That's difficult to explain. So we made the decision, Governor, Governor approved us to do this, is that we made a, developed a preschool completely tribally funded. And with no advertisement, we moved from 80 to 120 students this year. So that's a pretty significant increase. And so we were scurrying around trying to find classrooms <laughs> in order to place those kids. And we're going to be looking for the same problem because I think once we start advertising, I think we're going to add 20, 40, 60 more students. So it's a, it's a problem, but it's not a, it's not a bad problem. It's a good problem. And I hope that what, what that means is, is that we offer a quality program. 
And, and in order to have quality programs, you have to have quality teachers. And, uh, and we have to be willing to pay those. We serve our child care center, uh, our child care program serves about 1,300 students. Our Head Start serves 220, and our preschool serves 120. So we serve a lo pretty large number of students. And really, we're only in four locations now. At three Head Starts, one preschool, and, uh, well, actually, two, four Head Starts. So basically what we find is, is that each child is introduced to a variety of things. When they come into our child care program, and my child care director sitting right back there, uh, I can tell you, sorry. <clears throat> when they come to us as babies, we teach them how to use sign language so they can communicate. We want, we want to know what it is they need, what it is they want. And all of our students that are in Child Care Head Start preschool are exposed to, to uh, different languages, Chickasaw language, uh, uh, Spanish, English. We try to make a well-rounded program. And I, I will tell you, when they come in to our program, it's all about them. If you've not been to one of our child care facilities, where we have one day that's been there five or six years, uh, it's spectacular. When you walk in the door, Superintendent Hoffmeister has been there, she knows. Uh, and I will tell you this, I'm going to invite you, uh, at March 16th, we're going to have a grand opening for the one at Ardenmore. And believe it or not, it's better than the one at Ada. So we invite you to come to that one. Uh, we'll make sure you get an invitation. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all about kids. When you walk in the door, I tell people, when you walk in the door, students or parents walk in the door, kids come in on a slide. I mean, it's about kids. First thing that they see at Ada is they see an ice cream parlor. That's the reception desk. Throughout the building is streets with Chickasaw names, uh, identifying all kinds of toy things. So it's all about kids, and we understand that. And we understand how important it is that we ensure quality education in the classroom. And our child care program, our Head Start teachers, all of our child care and Head Start teachers and preschool teachers all have bachelor's degrees. And I will tell you, along with that, the 25% turnover in Head Start, that's what we used to deal with. Again, I was Head Start teacher. Every year we were replacing. We don't replace those anymore because we have our wages comparable to the state, what the state pays. And it's going to be better than that in the very near future. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it's because we, we feel like it's important. We want quality teachers. And in order to have quality teachers, you need to pay for quality <coughs> teachers. Used to, we had this happen regularly. We, had, we lost good Head Start teachers to the public school. Now it works the other way. We're taking them from them. So just so you'll know, uh, we have several former elementary teachers that are working with us. But all of our, all of our teachers either have an elementary ed degree or they have an early childhood degree. Uh, because we think it's important. We, we're willing to invest in the future. We're willing, and Governor is, is the leader in that. He will tell you in any conversation you have with him how important education is. That's how you make a difference in people's lives, is providing quality education. In order to have quality education, you have to have quality teachers. And you have to support them financially. You have to support them with mentors, with coaches, whatever it takes to make their, their, themselves to be more successful. That's what we want to do. So I think that, you know, when you go through the, and look at ours, oh, yeah, by the way, I, I, a couple of things I almost forgot. We have a, a STEM program as well. And one thing, I'll just walk through it right, real quickly. We have child care, Head Start, preschool. Then we have public school programs, which is Johnson O'Malley and the STEM program and a variety of things that we, that all are designed to make student reimbursement for tutoring. We do a lot of things to help public school teachers do a better job with their students. And then we have uh, education services, which is our, our uh, higher education, which we work with Provost a lot. We have a uh, sovereign center at OSU that we began a year ago that basically it's all about recruitment and retention of, of college students there at OSU. We're doing the same thing. I'll, I guess I'll bring that in a minute. And then we have also, uh, along with this, career tech. And then we have vocational rehabilitation. We work with people that have disabilities to help them be employable. And the last one is a brand new one we started about a year ago, and it's uh, called Choka Kalimpi, and it's designed for recruitment and retention of college students. So we, we divide them up in parts. One, we have, we have one person going to UCO, one going to OCCC, and one going to OU. And they go work with students and bring them in uh, to work with culture, to work with help them with tutoring, whatever they need. Because what we've learned is, if you're a fly on the wall, it's easy to fly away and nobody notices. But if you're engaged, if, they, if people know you're there, it's hard to walk away. 
It's hard to leave because people know you're not there. And so basically what we're trying to do is get them engaged in various activities to make them part of what's going on. Besides that, if they're engaged, they're a lot more active to be successful in their college career. And then the second half of that group is that we have, uh, and we'll start out with Norman as a, as a uh, beginning, a pilot, is we're, that we're going into the middle school and the high school promoting Oklahoma Promise. And because one of the things that, in my, from my perspective, I just had a son graduate last May, uh, and it's expensive to go to college, uh, mm -hmm. just like it is early childhood. And I, we need to look at student debt, reducing student debt. So being the old teacher that I am, I thought, Oklahoma Promise, I know full well we have a lot of students that never apply. And it's because at eighth grade, they think, I'm not going to college. Ninth grade, I'm not going to college. Tenth grade, I'm not going to college. Well, after that, it's too late to sign up for Oklahoma Promise. So what we're trying to do is work with parents, with students, to get them encouraged to apply, to be eligible for, just in case, in case you change your mind, then it's available to you. And, and from our perspective, basically what we do is, the, I, this is what I tell people, is tuition will be paid for with Oklahoma Promise. Chickasaw Nation, if you're Chickasaw, will be paid for, <coughs> will pay for the fees. And then, make, for goodness sakes, go out and get some more scholarships to pay for all your housing. Because uh, it's going to take it all. But I think that, you know, when you look at the things that's available to us, I hope this tells you that we, we're, we're concerned about education. And we're worried about from the very beginning. We want to start from the very beginning. Let's build a good foundation. Let's build a strong foundation. So in conclusion, I want to applaud the efforts of AERA and, and uh, the fact that they're doing what they're doing. They're doing six of those. And, and I appreciate them coming here and appreciate the opportunity you've given us to share with you what our, our uh, thoughts on this discussion. Thank you. Well, we're gonna we're gonna continue the conversation and invite you to participate. We've got two mics here uh, at either either side of the room, so feel free to come up with a question. And as I see someone come up here, I'll I'll, I'll call on you and, and and don't be shy about that. But uh, as some are, are coming forward, um, Deborah, let me ask you. You know, we we saw in this presentation and the lecture this idea of of access and um, and and the various reasons why some families. Are, are taking advantage or are able to take advantage of early care education programs and some are. And what, tell us a little bit, what does that look like here in Oklahoma? What are some of the access challenges that we have across the board, even with, you know, universal pre-K? Okay, yeah. there's, there's um, I, I think for different families, there's different access challenges. Um, if you are a low-income working family who maybe doesn't have a traditional job schedule, or doesn't have a lot of leave time to be able to take off to go stand in line to um, get into the lottery for pre-K if your school happens to have a waiting list, um, or if it's quite a challenge for you to um, apply for the benefits to get assistance with childcare, again, because of your work schedule and when you can work that out. Um, just being able to, to um, navigate your busy stress schedule with what it takes to find the resources and access the resources can be quite a challenge. Um, I think for other families, they might not even know where to begin. And one of the things I talk about um, is that I, to me, early childhood, to many parents can kind of look like a very messy closet. It's like, I need a good outfit for my child for early childhood, and I go to that closet, and it's like, I don't even know where to find what I'm looking for. And uh, part of the focus that, that we hope to accomplish through our organization and coordination with others is coordinating that closet for families so that they can find the right resources for them. It's really important to, to remember that not all families and not all children need the same uh, formula, if you will, need the same types of services, need the same outfit uh, in order to be able to be successful. So, um, you know, Cost is another issue that I could, you know, I could spend more time on. Childcare costs uh, for families, as Dr. Vandell um, highlighted, is is really, really a challenge um, to be able to fit that into um, your family budget. Uh, so we <clears throat> we see we see quite a few problems with families just saying, I just can't afford to put my child into those high quality licensed childcare homes, and they sometimes. Uh, feel forced to seek alternatives that maybe aren't the safest and aren't the most stimulating, but they're kind of caught between that rock and a hard place of what they can afford and what they're able to access. 
And then just kind of one more thing that I want to add about, I think, challenges with the state of Oklahoma is it's very different if you live in an urban area versus if you live in our rural areas. And we, the closet's much messier in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and there's a lot more choices. In rural areas, it's very, very difficult to find the to have available the types of services that families need. Our budget cuts have even impacted the services that are available in rural areas even greater than uh, probably what we experienced about five years ago. Yeah, thank you. Well, we've got uh, a couple here. Um, I guess we'll just we'll start here and move over. I, I, I introduce yourself if you wouldn't mind, and uh, yeah, ask your question. Let's see if I can get this down. My name is Kathy Crummiller, and I'm a provider here in Oklahoma. I have six child care facilities, but I want to bring to the conversation, one, I want to add um, about not only the Chickasaws, but all, we have numerous tribes in Oklahoma that pay for child care outside of their local child care centers, which uh, Mr. Wells is familiar with, which is nice. I have eight different contracts with eight different tribes at my six centers right now where the tribes pay pretty much like they pay the same reimbursement rate to me as my three star facilities as um, DHS pays for us currently. So I wanted to add that piece to that because that's really helped a lot of parents in Oklahoma um, with, with those services that the tribes have started coming in and helping with their child care. The other thing that I want to address and make part of the conversation is what parents' choices that they have now. I operate two 24-hour centers. They operate, um, we start at six, well actually we start at four o'clock on Monday morning and I close at six o'clock on Saturday afternoon, Saturday afternoon. One, because I got tired of being, we, we have to have a day to clean. <laughs> so we're closed on Sundays, plus the fact if anything was going to go wrong as far as a parent coming up drunk and partying, that always seemed to be Saturday night. And, and I'm now in my 60s. When I was in my 30s, that wasn't a big option. But now I just can't keep bringing children home on Saturday night anymore, <laughs> as I used to have to do. But the, what's happened is in the last six years, my 24-hour facilities have increased where my license capacity for, and I'm going to talk about ACORN, it's at 51st in Portland. I'm not trying to advertise, I just want you to be aware of this, that I am licensed for 180, but we're running close to 270 to 300 children between Monday and Saturday now, and that's due to the work schedules of the parents have changed. It's no longer an eight to five jobs. I have moms that are working at the airport, TSA. I have attorney's children. I have really acorn is, I call it my melting pot of Oklahoma City because I have all kinds of varieties. I have police officers' children. I have fire uh, department's children. I have two major hospitals which, which are close by, which is Deaconess Hospital and Baptist Hospital. But we have, the retail has changed. Used to our malls were open, um, mo I mean, sorry, stores were o open from like 10 to 6. Malls, <coughs> Target, they open up now at 8 o'clock and they're closing at 10, let alone Crest, who we have, and, and uh, all the other block, well, the restaurants have started exceeding their hours. So we have more and more workers that are making choices to take those jobs because they can make just a little bit more if they work a night jobs. And our single moms are now having to make these choices is I have to pay childcare. I might as well take a job where I can make 75 cents more an hour to help pay for my childcare or to help pay for my rent. And that has increased in my facilities in the last six years, that's why we have 270 children now at one facility. I'm feeding just as many for supper as I am for lunch. And I can't tell you the calls that we get on a daily basis is, I'm sorry, we're full. I, I can't take any more children. And people, it, it's 24-hour care is hard. I, I'll just tell you yeah. that. And, it's, and I have people driving from Waterloo Road. They're driving from Newcastle. They're driving, and they come and bring the children. I have the mother that works at the airport. She's a TSA. She lives um, south of, what's the little town? I'm sorry, I can't think of the town. South of Norman, anyway. And she drives all the way to 50th in Portland. Then she drives all the way to the airport to work. So these are choices that, that people are making now, but it's not really part of the child care conversation. We're not really talking about 
uh, wor the work hours of what parents are doing. And I just want to make sure that that is part of the conversation. And we're going to have to to start thinking outside the box because we have parents with children in in bad situations. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many more years <clears throat> I can keep staying open. 24 hours. I, you know, like I said, I'm in my 60s, and I don't see any way I'm going to retire <laughs> because of the families that we're choosing. And there's not any other centers really, first of all, probably not even thinking about the needs, but there is, it's increasing, and we need to make, part, make sure that's part of the conversation. Thank good, you. Good yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, and I mean, have we, I mean, we talk about just the changing dynamics, the changing schedules, and this kind of need to kind of innovate and think outside the box. I mean, are we, are we seeing um, you know, the sector respond to that? And uh, I mean, Danny, I mean, what, what have you guys seen in terms of the well, challenges? I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you how we kind of, we, we, unfortunately, we, we don't have that, and, and that's a great system, and you're to be applauded for that because that takes a lot of planning and, uh, and a lot of staff and, and a, lot, a, a lot of effort. Um, we have done some things, and, and I neglected to say that a while ago. One of the things that we've really tried to work on is transitioning. You know, we talk about sequencing things mm -hmm. and, and making sure that we have. We want it to be a seamless transition when they leave child care to Head Start, uh, you know, public school and on. And, and we have an after school program and a school age program that uh, we have, they're basically 4 to 12 year old students that they have no place to go after school. And so basically what we did was we, we saw a need. Michelle's always looking for things. And, and so she said, hey, we've we got a need. We've got to do this. And so we, uh, we well, I don't know how many, it's been a few years ago, we implemented the first one and then uh, I guess it was two years ago we doubled, and then the next year we doubled again, the after school and school age program. Uh, we, we're maxed out right now, kind of like she was talking about. We're maxed out on space. We're, we have no space. We're, le we're leasing a uh, building, an early childhood building that uh, Ada Public School built a new one, and we're using that one. We've maxed out. Uh, but there's, that's an indication of how much need there is. So basically that's one of the things, that, but we're only serving them until 530. Mm -hmm. But at least in, in a lot of the places, if they work for the tribe, for instance, they're off at 5 and so it's a place for those, kids, those children to go. Yeah. But uh, she's exactly right. The schedules have changed so dramatically that we sometimes overlook those that are working night jobs. And, you know, so she's, she's addressing a super, a super need. Yeah. Yeah, right over here. Yeah, please introduce yourself. And, uh, yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Harriet Dudley, and I am at Tulsa Community College, where I have a responsibility to ensure that students complete a credential and either go into the workforce or transfer to a baccalaureate granting degree institution. My background is early childhood, so I also have a responsibility to ensure student success. And my question is about your thoughts and research on online education as we prepare teachers and coach teachers to teach. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. Is yeah, this is working. Great. Um, we actually have a, a program at UC Irvine that we're working on right now, um, not in the early childhood area, but in the after school area, where we're, uh, uh, there's a badge that we're, we're doing in, the, in collaboration with the National After School Association, where we're working with developing tutoring skills that can be used in after school programs, that can be used by uh, community groups in working with um, after school providers. That's a, it, it, um, uh, the online platform is working really well in that case. Um, we are um, doing some other kind of online things. The, the people that I know of that have been doing some online uh, in, the, in the early childhood area are some of the people out of the University of Virginia. And that work um, is a one that I think it's my teaching partner that makes use of some video yes. and online work and uh, that's being very effective, I think. Yeah, yeah um, thinking more broadly about online education for what you might think of as a caring professions, uh, there are a number of programs around the country, for example, in nursing, uh, in education. So there's, it, what you have to be careful about is there are certain, some things that are, you can do well online and others that you can't. The obvious example is uh, clinical experiences, you know, if you want people to have hands-on experiences, then that has to be in some kind of a setting where they learn from skilled professionals about how to do their work. But I think certainly online education can play a role in, in the training of many kinds of uh, helping professions. Yeah. yeah, we have another question over here. 
Hi, my name is John Thompson, and my uh, field was high school, and I'm retired from high school, so I've got a question for Dr. Vandell uh, that were, it's beyond my expertise, but last week's article on Fade Out by Bailey, Duncan, and Ogden, and am I reading this correctly? I felt like the first half of the article and the headline emphasized the pessimistic side. By the time they finished, they were sounding a lot like you. <laughs> and then about the point in the article where they said fade out is the process of other children catching cap up and talking about how public schools weren't doing a very good job of dealing with stress, not doing things developmentally appropriate, seemed to me that despite the headlines, it was criticizing public education. And I'm wondering what you guys can do to send a message to us in public education that we need to deal with reading for comprehension, <coughs> stress, meaningful education that ties with our culture. And also, am I reading the article correctly? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm impressed that you saw the, the piece that was in the Washington Post. Um, I saw it yesterday when I was in the airport. Uh, Professor Duncan's office is about three doors down from mine, and um, my read of the article is sort of like yours as well. I thought the headline was really unfortunate, and I thought that some of the early part in the article was unfortunate. Um, I, I also think that it is um, really too soon to tell about the long-term effects of these contemporary programs. It's really too early. The, the findings related to less grade retention and uh, better attendance, those kinds of skills, let fewer special education placements, those I think are really good harbingers of future long-term outcomes. I think that the work on test scores that um, to be focusing too narrowly just on test scores in that elementary grade is, um, uh, there, there, there's always been some movement in that middle period. And so I don't, I tend to be focusing more on the longer term outcomes. And I think what would be very unfortunate would be to cut early childhood funding, cut Head Start, cut pre-K, reduce the kinds of supports that we're giving for families who are doing childcare. I think to cut those and then have children go to kindergarten less prepared is, would, would be a huge mistake, a huge mistake. And so I, um, uh, I have my uh, doctoral class <laughs> reads the paper that Drew Bailey wrote with, with Greg Duncan. It's a really interesting paper to sort of think about what may account for some of the fade out and some of those are things that I integrated in my, my talk. I think that's, um, I think we've got to address fade out, and I think we've got to think about the alignment, but I really don't want to throw <coughs> the baby out with the bathwater, with saying that early child care, we don't need it, or early childhood, we don't need it. I think that would be a huge mistake. Well, and, and before we, we go to another question in the audience, uh, you know, we talk about this, the, the challenge of funding and what's at stake. And, um, and Deborah, can you kind of give us a little bit clearer of a picture of, you know, you, you know, you referenced it in your remarks, I mean, the, the funding challenge crisis that we face in Oklahoma right now. Um, what's at stake? I mean, what, is, what, what do you kind of see as uh, the challenges um, with the, with the depleted state funding situation that we have facing uh, early care and education in Oklahoma? Well, I know that um, agencies have had to make some tough decisions in relation to funding for some of the early childhood programs. Um, there used to be a very robust parents as teachers program that the State Department of Education um, administered. And um, due to funding budget cuts, it was an unfortunate decision that they had to zero out that funding. So there were a number of school districts and families across the state that lost the ability to participate in those home-based services to help prepare their children um, for school. Um, in the um, DHS childcare world, um, they're trying really hard 
to ensure that we have the dollars available to support um, families who want to receive assistance. Um, but we're not putting additional state dollars into that. We have not changed the family copay scale since 2008. So a family could be at 100% of poverty and maybe be paying $160 a month for childcare if they're, if they're on that childcare subsidy, um, which is about 10% of their income. So, so not adding additional state investments into child care. Um, on top of that, they have had to reduce some of the support for quality. Um, we've eliminated the requirement for the environmental rating scales and um, eliminated some of the professional development supports that we were able to provide. Um, and then on the health end, um, there's the constant struggle to maintain our um, early childhood programs there, the home-based family support and center-based family support services. Um, and again, as I said earlier, where we feel there has been the most significant impact is in our rural parts of the state where mm -hmm. things have just disappeared. Yeah. Um, and families either have to do without services or have miles and miles that they have to drive. And if you're low income, um, that's just not feasible to go to the next county to get services. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think a uh, question over here. Yeah, and this kind of goes along a little bit with the question you just asked, but, um, and I'm Marnie Dunlap, I'm a general pediatrician at the Oklahoma Health Science Center. And so my question is, how do we change the general thought of funding early childhood? I mean, your graph was very nice of how, you know, I mean, barely above minimum wage, we pay some people, but then the high end of the scale was our public school teachers who we know, I mean, that's like the gold standard of achieving high income. I mean, we are talking in this state all the time about how we don't pay our teachers. I mean, it's kind of like when we compare Medicaid to Medicare, and we're trying to get you know, kids to go up to where the adults are, but we all know Medicare doesn't pay very well either. So how do we change the whole conversation knowing you know, the importance of the early years and the neuroscience and the brain developments that's coming out of, of the really importance and the reality that a lot of kids aren't home with their parents anymore and they have to be in childcare. How do we get that quality up knowing that that costs money? Yeah, great question, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, one of the numbers that I gave tonight, which I find promising, was that 90% of the people who were surveyed in 2016 were endorsing increased public investments, which in the parenthesis is increased taxes. And that was across both Democrats and Republicans with saying that they thought that early childhood education and care was worth it. So I think even, so even as we talk about various budget cuts, and we talk about tough financial situations, I really hope that our um, um, public officials, um, my law, lawmakers will really say, you know what, there, there are some things to spend on that are really worth it, and that will really pay back what we need to do. To do. And I think we need to communicate with um, uh, the public um, what's going on? Because I think people, I think people will in, in, in be willing to invest in what's I think almost a sure thing in terms of outcomes. But I think we, we uh, I hope our lawmakers will really start paying. And that some of it's local, and some of it's uh, some of it's local, some of it's state, and, and some of it's federal. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just add, um, when we think about our state investments in early childhood, they're primarily discretionary dollars. Uh, we have a lot of federal money, not enough, but we have federal money that comes to the state um, that supports a fair amount of our programs, um, and, and our discretionary dollars seem to be um, it, those that are in greatest jeopardy. Some states have looked for alternative <coughs> funding strategies um, through an uh, earmark tax or uh, leveraging their tobacco settlement dollars or looking at local dollars and how they can better leverage those local dollars to support um, their early childhood programs. And I think it's obvious that we need to get more creative in thinking about our financing strategies in our state. Yeah. Yeah, we have another question. Oh, sorry, did no. you add? Okay. <laughs> Yes, Charles Wilson, Langston University, uh, 2014 criminal justice major, 2016 urban education grad student now. 
as we were talking about early childhood development and educational research, and I was sitting here thinking like, okay, what does the panels, because your living room looks a little different than the urban living room. Think about our school to prison pipeline. What does the student, uh, the future educators think about four, five, six, seven, eight year old kids being locked up and policed by our policemen? Then just kind of bounce me some ideas and see what, what everyone's thinking about that issue, okay? <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to touch that one. <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can start. I think, uh, I think not just in Oklahoma, but in Wisconsin, where I lived for 30 years and in other states, there is a real concern about the proportion of the population that's incarcerated. And it really is too high. And it, it's better to keep people in school as long as possible than to uh, have them uh, in jail or in prison. I think there's a growing um, consensus among liberals and conservatives that what we're doing right now is not really working very well. And we, we, we'll, we need to think uh, carefully and, and look at programs and best practices and, and learn, learn from experiments that are taking place about uh, you know, what's an effective way for keeping someone in school and keeping them from um, having problems with the criminal justice system. There, there are problems you know, in communities, there are problems in the criminal justice system. It's not an easy thing to resolve, I don't think. But I think you're, you're pointing at a really important problem. And the, you know, to improve our society, to move forward as a society, it's, it's a problem that we have to come together as liberals, conservatives, what, you know, whatever your perspective and figure out what we can do about this problem. So the early, the early childhood findings that were, go, that were going to adulthood, we're finding in those projects um, less likely to be arrested, less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. So I think that the early childhood is a piece of this. I mean, it's gonna be a long-term piece. There is a shorter term piece that I think we also need to be looking at, and that is um, after school care and activities. So that um, another one of my research areas besides early childhood is um, after school and summer programming. And um, what we know, uh, and the Department of Justice has this and others, that that period between three and six in the um, afternoon is the period when, in which young people are most likely to be getting um, in trouble. Um, and so uh, I know that some of the Oklahoma um, districts are thinking about going to four-day school. Right. I would see that as a big potential problem as you're thinking about potential engagement in um, uh, delinquent activities, criminal activities. So I think that um, uh, one of the strategies, a proactive strategy that I would encourage people to be thinking about, and I know that I know that Oklahoma has a, an expanded learning network and has people here tonight who are working on after school programming and summer programming. It's really an important prevention <coughs> area. But it starts with early childhood. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just also like to say that um, we, could do a much better job of incorporating our infant and early childhood and early elementary mental health supports. Mm -hmm. um, in my former position, I worked under Cabinet Secretary uh, Klein at the Child Guidance Program where we focused a lot on being able to provide those kinds of behavioral health supports for families, not only like they had to come to the health department for services, but how do we embed those in child care centers and in public schools? Because I know teachers struggle when they have a child that is a challenge uh, in, with their behavior, and it's really difficult to manage that behavior when you have a lot of other children that you're, you're spending your time on. We have some really well-trained staff in the state that have implement some very effective strategies for helping ensure and support that teacher and the child and the family um, so that they're not being kicked out of school, they're not being arrested at school, um, but that we can, can better support them being able to um, appropriately be able to maintain in that classroom. 
And that's a, a limited funding stream in our state that could do a lot to help reduce those um, expulsions and um, suspensions for young children. And I think it's an issue, especially for young <coughs> children, that we've really got to pay some good attention to from child care through those early years of school so we don't start on a, a, a negative trajectory of behavior issues. I had a staff member um, who was struggling with that with her son, and it just broke my heart that there wasn't more support, and he eventually um, got arrested at a very young age at school. So we, we really have to figure out how we can do a better job with those supports. Ben, could I add to that? Sure. Uh, I will tell you one of the things that we've tried to do in regard to that is uh, Michelle, in our child care program, we have an early intervention part of our program. And what those, that staff does is they go into both the Head Start and the, and, and the child care program and at the request of teachers, that whether it be behavior issues, maybe <coughs> they're, they think it's vision, hearing, whatever it may be, and they go in to that classroom, make observations, and then they work with that, with that child to address whatever it may be. If it's behavior, then we try to provide some counseling and get some counseling. We don't necessarily have counselors on staff, but we have access to those. And yep. uh, so, you know, I think from, again, from the old teacher standpoint, early intervention sure be trying to fix things after it's too late. Yep. And so we feel like if we, can inter if we can have early intervention when they're little, when they're small, when they're young, then we're going to have a lot more success in changing the behavior or the changing whatever it is that, that's wrong. Yeah. Well, we've got time for, uh, I think, one more question. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you'd like to introduce yourself and, uh, and offer your question. I'm Marge Marnie, and I work for the Potts Family Foundation. Um, I was wondering how you counter um, the effects of a society that uh, has an image of us creating a nanny state. by putting these kinds of programs and things in, I think they've lost um, the connection with middle class families are struggling too in all areas of getting them for their children and certainly for the lower class, uh, lower income. They seem to think that if you are doing that, that you are creating a state that is raised by social services, not the home. And they've lost the, um, the connection of how hard it is for middle class and lower class income families to even make it with, they want to work. They want to join the workforce and contribute, but they've got to have these supports in order to do that. And they don't seem to have that connection with it. Yeah. What, one of the things when I'm talking to policymakers is that I stress that um, unless you've been involved in the court due to abuse and neglect, um, all of the services that families participate in are voluntary. And over 75% of our families are voluntarily participating in our public pre-K programs because they feel that that's a benefit to their child for their early learning. Um, we have, you know, we could be serving more families in other programs if we had the dollars to do that. So I think having those resources out there that families are voluntarily saying, yes, I want this information and this support um, to help me ensure that my child is on that right path towards school readiness. That doesn't totally um, maybe answer your question, but I, I do stress the voluntary nature that families are choosing to participate in these services. And so when I hear about the 90%, I'm just wondering, are they in Oklahoma? <laughs> That's the only thing I'm concerned about, because I just don't think a lot, that is a 90% image in Oklahoma. and. Um, you know, I understand that there's um, around 900 children that are on a waiting list for even pre-K, pre and we think we are covering that so well, but we're not serving all of them. So, anyway. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and as we've talked about, obviously that uh, 
that challenge to access that still exists uh, quite a, across the spectrum, even you know, in a state with you know, universal pre-K. So yeah, thank you for that comment and that question. Well, um, such a great lecture and a, a fascinating panel discussion. Um, thank you so much. I want to invite you to join me in thanking our panelists here uh, for their time. So as you can see, we did it together. <laughs> and, and we're really uh, pleased that we were able to do so. Um, I suspect when one is standing as executive director, one shouldn't run the risk of not acknowledging everyone who should be acknowledged. So first I want to acknowledge all of you for being here. It was reference to Terry Klein, Commissioner of Health, and we are delighted to have him with us. And especially we wanted to acknowledge there was reference to uh, Joy Hofsmeyer, who I had the privilege of meeting earlier, and to have uh, the uh, leading superintendent of, in Oklahoma of schools and health together, I think reflects exactly why we have a lecture like this and a discussion forum right. like this with local and engaged persons who are doing what you're doing. There was a question about education research and um, <clears throat> And I actually wanted to emphasize that our sixth lecture is on the uh, prison, uh, school to prison pipeline. Our fifth, which is in uh, Detroit in, uh, in March, is, is, is taking up the issue of schools uh, and, and poverty in, a, in Detroit, an urban community. And in each one, the conversations have raised important issues about research, raised important issues about the value of statistics and data, and knowledge, and what we saw here is a very reflective community. We don't have all the answers. Research can help and enable your work, and we also want to know more about the questions you have so that we can all together uh, do better. So I want to really thank Ben here <laughs> for being a super moderator, yeah. Gary, Deborah, we've got the Deborahs here, we've got the Deborahs and we have the Danny, and without whom and without you, uh, this evening would not be uh, what it was and what it will be in the future with you. I also want to say for those who are joining us online, well, you're going to miss the reception, the informal <laughs> chit chat, we hope it's not too late for breakfast, dinner, or whatever time zone you're in, and that you come and join with us. Uh, online again, or if you're in Detroit, come visit us. And I want to wish everyone a lovely evening and recognize that while we have blips at various points in the developmental process, early investments pay off, and we need to work together to make that happen. And thank you, and good evening. <laughs>